Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you may press star 1 on your touchtone phone to ask a question. I would like to inform all parties that today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Andrea De Silva, International Trade Administration. Thank you. You may begin. Good evening, everyone. This is Andrea calling from Washington, D.C., and welcome to our webinar to discuss intellectual property issues and the regulatory environment for the film and entertainment industry in China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. I would like to thank Janice Wingo, who's an intellectual property lawyer uh, with me in ITA in Washington, D.C., for organizing the spectacular panel of speakers um, and she will be at Hong Kong Film March um, to meet with you in person, for those of you who will also be on the ground. First up, I would like to introduce um, Edward Shatterton, who is a DLA Piper, who will be talking about the copyright and intellectual property rights enforcement um, uh, arena in Hong Kong. And he will be followed by Charmaine Ku, who is with uh, Deacons, and she will talk about the clearances necessary for studios that want to shoot a film in Hong Kong. And without any further ado, Edward, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Edward Chatterton. I'm a partner in the IPT practice in Hong Kong. Uh, I specialize in intellectual property, and I've been asked today to give a brief overview of copyright law, particularly as it pertains to the film industry. Uh, in Hong Kong, and then to give an overview of the copyright regime in Hong Kong. I'm then going to talk about some of the challenges which the film industry is facing from an IP perspective, particularly fo focusing on the challenge to rights owners from the unauthorized copying of content. Uh, in inevitably, this overview will be quite high level because I only have uh, 10 minutes for, for this session. So moving to the uh, first slide. I thought it would be helpful if I just gave a very brief overview of uh, the sort of structure of the film industry in Hong Kong in terms of the, the number of films. Uh, and as you can see from the slide, the, the number of local films released, i.e. produced in Hong Kong and released in Hong Kong in 2013 and 14 is set out there uh, on the slide. And you can see that in 2014, just over 50 local films were released. So that's small compared to the number of foreign films that were released in Hong Kong, but given that Hong Kong is a city of 8 million people, it is quite a significant number of local films produced in Hong Kong. So per capita, it has a very large and very dynamic film and entertainment industry um, and has captured a very significant part of the regional market uh, for Chinese-speaking uh, films. Uh, most local film companies deal directly with cinema chains for local screening on a, a revenue-sharing basis, and rights are then sold to distribution companies for other forms of release, including video rental and sales, and so on. Uh, there are also companies which specialize in distributing foreign films in Hong Kong. Um, as of February 2015, there were 47 cinemas in Hong Kong, and films are mainly released through channels such as United Artists, Broadway Circuit, MCL, and so on. Uh, other movie distribution channels, including selling films via DVDs and C CDs, and also broadcasting via local uh, free television channels, pay, te pay TV, subscription satellite services, and also growing online platforms such as uh, Amazon, iTunes, uh, and also Google Play. So that's an overview of the of the uh, the industry in, in Hong Kong. Um, moving to the next slide, mm -hmm. I would like to give a, a copyright 101, um, just a very brief overview of copyright. And um, copyright is a fundamental legal right possessed by authors of creative works. The first thing to bear in mind about copyright is fundamentally it is a negative right. Uh, it's a right to prevent copying as opposed to a positive uh, right which um, can be used to prevent other people from, from doing something. So, for example, if somebody created the same work independently, it would not be an infringement of copyright. Um, generally, the first owner 
is the author of a work. Uh, there are, however, a number of exceptions to that general principle. The important ones are for a work produced by an employee in his capacity as an employee. Uh, copyright belongs to the employer. Similarly, a person who commissions a work, for example, paying for the painting of a portrait, has an exclusive license to exploit the work, uh, just like the author. Uh, the producer is the author of a sound recording, and the producer, together with the principal directors, are the authors of a film, and therefore have uh, share copyright in that film. Uh, the copyright in a broadcast belongs to the broadcaster. Um, the important thing to bear in mind about copyright is that it protects the form of expression uh, as opposed to um, the idea. So it's often said that copyright doesn't protect ideas, only the way in which those ideas are in fact expressed. So it's possible for someone else to, to express similar ideas but in a different format and not infringe copyright. Moving to the next slide. IP laws in uh, Hong Kong um, are, are domestic, but there are also many international copyright conventions in Hong Kong which apply. I'll talk about those um, very briefly shortly. But one of the main features of copyright in, in Hong Kong is that copyright is an automatic right. By that, I mean that it arises when a work is created. So unlike other intellectual property rights, such as patents, trademarks, industrial designs, it's not necessary to register a copyright in Hong Kong. That differs, for example, from other countries such as in China or the US where it is, whilst not mandatory, it is feasible and, and possible to register uh, copyright. That means there is no official register in Hong Kong for the registration of copyright works. So in fact, it can often be very difficult to determine whether or not a third party owns uh, copyright in a particular work. It's an open qualification system in Hong Kong, which means that any original copyright work created by a person uh, published anywhere in the world can qualify for copyright protection in Hong Kong. That's pursuant to international conventions, which Hong Kong has signed up to, which basically require Hong Kong to give reciprocal rights to other uh, copyright owners elsewhere. Um, it, one point I would make about Hong Kong copyright law and Hong Kong intellectual property laws generally is they are domestic. So a right given under Hong Kong law only applies in Hong Kong. Um, it does not apply, for example, further afield, such as in, in, in China. And similarly, Chinese domestic copyright law does not apply in, in Hong Kong. Uh, as discussed earlier, there are various international uh, copyright conventions applying in Hong Kong, such as the Berne Convention, the Universal Copyright Convention, uh, the, the TRIPS Treaty, um, and, uh, and so on. Um, essentially, um, the key thing to bear in mind about Hong Kong is it is a common law-based system. It is generally extremely pro-rights owner. Um, and um, it, it has a system which most, uh, most people who are familiar with the U.S. common law system would be very familiar, very at home with the Hong Kong system. It's a common law system based on, on case law and established precedent, and there's a strong concept of the rule of law in, in Hong Kong. The copyright ordinance in Hong Kong is the key um, statute which governs copyright in Hong Kong, uh, and it's the, the, the sort of principal comprehensive legislation covering copyright. Um, one of the key things I wanted to flag in this session was the Copyright Amendment Bill 2014, which is currently before the Bills Committee of the Legislative uh, Assembly here in Hong Kong. Um, and the aim of this bill is to introduce some very significant changes to copyright law within Hong Kong. Um, I'll talk about a couple of them, but I particularly want to highlight um, how those changes will affect the enforcement uh, uh, of rights online. Um, one of the key um, changes will be a technology neutral exclusive right for copyright owners to communicate their work through mode, any mode of electronic transmission. 
essentially the, the, the intention is to keep pace with the rapid changes in technology and to grant copyright owners uh, a right which does not depend upon the particular way in which it's communicated is a technology neutral exclusive right but the idea is to uh, give rights owners the ability to prevent third parties from communicating their copyright work through electronic transmission. And it, it similarly will introduce a corresponding criminal sanction for the unauthorized communication of copyright work to the public. The other key change is the establishment of a what's called a statutory safe harbor for uh, online service providers so that their liabilities for copyright infringement occurring on their service platforms will be limited, provided that those OSPs meet certain prescribed conditions, including the taking of reasonable steps to limit or stop copyright infringement. The, the aim of the proposal is to facilitate OSPs' handling of alleged infringements and to balance the rights between copyright owners and users. The purpose of the introduction of this measure is to address the significant increase in online piracy um, which has taken place in Hong Kong and also throughout the world. I will talk about the, this measure in a little bit more detail later on. Um, one other uh, ordinance I wanted to highlight is the Prevention of Copyright, or, uh, copyright Piracy Ordinance which makes, makes provision for the prevention of copyright piracy using the medium of optical discs, such as DVDs. Um, that, to some extent, feels like almost a slightly defunct provision now. And I'll, I'll go on just to discuss why I think that it is a, declining, uh, a provision of declining importance. Um, Challenges to copyright protection in Hong Kong have traditionally been uh, around bootlegging of CDs, i.e. direct copying of CDs and DVDs. And statistically, um, the Hong Kong Customs has seized um, significant quantities of CDs and DVDs, but that is now a very much a declining trend. Um, as you can see from the slide, in 2011, there were 323 seizures. That's now declined to, 200, uh, to, to 99 in 2013. And similarly, there's been a decline in the number and val the number of people arrested and the value of those seizures. Uh, there's a very, very clear, very simple explanation for this, which most people will already understand, uh, which is that there's been a significant increase in online copyright piracy, and that essentially has taken the place of the bootlegging of copyright uh, DVDs and CDs. And in fact, actually, probably the overall amount of piracy has significantly increased. Um, it's a major, major problem for owners of films and TV producers. Um, essentially, it's a very difficult, um, very difficult thing to enforce because there are so many different ways in which copyright in films can be uh, copy, uh, can be infringed uh, over the internet from peer to peer file sharing streaming and so on and uh, the other reason it's very difficult to actually enforce for film producers is that infringements can occur in Hong Kong for example people downloading or watching videos online in Hong Kong but the infringements may in fact originate from somewhere else so I'm currently dealing with a case where the infringement occurs in Hong Kong, but the, the actual um, source of the infringement is in Thailand, and the, uh, the actual illegal content is being ripped from sources in Malaysia, Malaysia and the US. So very much um, film producers have to look at the enforcement of their rights for, at an international level and not purely on a country by country basis. Um, just in terms of the options which are available for, for copyright owners, um, the options essentially are filing a complaint to customs um, for bootlegging. Um, customs have extensive powers of seizure and, and search in the investigation infringements. I've set down there the penalties for um, infringements in, in Hong Kong. It's also possible to take civil action by copyright owners and exclusive licensees and civil action through the courts 
which are generally very effective, can include the remedies for that can include injunctions, damages, accounts of profits, and so on. Very much remedies which you in the U.S. will be familiar with uh, and will be uh, commonly known to you. Um, the recommendations we give, given the vast increase in online piracy for, for copyright owners in Hong Kong and elsewhere would be think very carefully about monitoring online infringements and take use, make use of the takedown processes which are provided by uh, online content providers. So very often uh, uh, OSPs will have takedown processes whereby you can notify them and they will take down uh, unlawful content uh, within a reasonable period of time. The other option you have if they don't provide for that is to send a cease and desist letter to online service providers to put them on notice of infringements which are taking place. Now, I talked earlier about the safe harbor provisions which are being introduced or intended to be introduced by the Copyright Amendment Ordinance 2014. That safe harbor has not yet been introduced by the Hong Kong legislature. What that means is that film producers are in a position of having to um, address copyright infringement online without that safe harbor. And the principal way in which that is done is to place online service providers on notice. And by doing that, what you're trying to do is fix them with liability for aiding, assisting, or otherwise authorizing the primary infringement of the infringer. And once you place them on notice, you're trying to essentially fix them with liability. That can be a very effective way of, of getting material taken down by, because typically it's very difficult to take action against the infringers directly, but by taking action against the online service providers, by placing them on notice, it's very often possible to get the online service providers to remove the infringing content. I've set out there essentially the proposed way in which online service providers uh, will be, um, complaints will be possible to be made to them under the proposed new law when it is introduced. And essentially, um, to sum it up, it, you provide those OSPs with a, a, a notice of infringement. The OSP then has a period of time to remove or disable access to that material. During that process, the OSP will notify their client, the infringer, uh, and give reasons for the removal of the service. The subscriber will then be given an opportunity to give a counter notice, disputing or denying the infringement. The OSP will then send that counter notice to the complainant, and um, there will then be an opportunity for the complainant to counter that. Um, essentially, if, if the complainant doesn't then continue with the complaint, uh, it's not resolved, the OSP will reinstate that material. The, OS, the OSP provision is very much based on the safe harbor provisions which are currently in force in the European Union. Um, to some extent, they are not a complete uh, resolution of the film industry's concerns about online copying because essentially if the, if the subscriber gives a counter notice, the, uh, the OSP will not then adjudicate on that counter notice and it will then be for the complainant to make a complaint to the courts yeah. and only once the complaint to the court, courts is then adjudicated will the material be taken down. So it is possible for the infringer essentially to deny infringement and for that to stymie the rights owner in taking uh, infringement down. Uh, but there's, there still remains a possibility for uh, uh, rights owners to take online infringement through civil actions uh, through the, the courts up until the point at which the safe harbor uh, is introduced. Now, that then ends my section of the talk. I'm now handing over, uh, I believe, to Charmaine Ku from Deacons. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. no, I can hear you. 
Hi. Um, I I'm very sorry. Actually, I don't see where I can move the slides. Uh huh. You can now see where you can move the sure. slides. Can you see the button at the bottom left where it says one of eleven? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have that button. I have the slides. Just say next slide and I'll move them for you, okay? okay. Sorry? If you just say next slide, I will oh, move okay. them for okay. you. Okay, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Charmaine Koo. Um, I'm a partner with the law firm Deakins, and I'm the head of the um, media and entertainment practice, and I'm also the co-head of the intellectual property department. Um, uh, I've assisted many uh, U.S. and European studios in uh, their co-productions in Asia, so um, today I'll share with you some of my experience um, and tips for clearances in uh, shooting in Hong Kong. Um, I think as many of us will have noticed, um, in recent years there ha has been a great increase in number of films um, including high-profile films being shot in Hong Kong or Hong Kong and China or Hong Kong and Macau. Um, and they include um, The Dark Knight, Mission Impossible, um, James Bond film, Die Another Day, um, and recently Transformer. So, you know, for whatever reason people are attracted to come to Asia, um, perhaps it's because of the distinctive or exotic um, locations or the, you know, the perceived lower cost in um, production, or maybe it's an opportunity to distribute in um, the Asian market or attract Asian audience. Um, but definitely increasingly we're seeing um, more and more people coming or being interested in um, shooting or producing in uh, Asia. So next slide, please. Hello, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I don't know if anyone of you have heard, um, but it was quite a big thing in Hong Kong. Um, this is a, a slide showing um, headline from the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, which is the leading English newspaper. Um, it says, Transformer director attacked by zombie triad welding aircon unit. So this is Michael Bay um, being attacked by triad in Hong Kong while he was shooting Transformer in Hong Kong. So I, I understand that the story has actually been spread around the world and certainly been uh, reported in Hollywood as well. So does that mean that shooting in Hong Kong is actually really difficult or really dangerous. So maybe today I'll share with you some of the um, uh, overview of the legal and regulatory environment. Next slide, please. Well, basically, overall in Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong has a very free environment. Um, it's a free trade uh, you know, uh, city, uh, which means that there are very, very minimal import, export, licensing, or regulations. Um, there are no unions in the entertainment industry, so no SAG, no minimum payments, no rules governing, um, you know, people that cast or crew that you hire in Hong Kong. Um, people generally work very, very hard, work very, very long hours, um, and, you know, there are no, uh, you know, union uh, minimum payments and, and requirements like that. Um, so generally, the minimum overall regulation in Hong Kong is very, very uh, uh, low. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So when shooting in Hong Kong, um, generally, you do not require a, uh, any permission um, unless you are shooting on private property. So for example, if you're shooting on property under government control, such as uh, country parks, beaches, or government buildings, uh, or private property, um, obviously, you would need to get their permission. Um, and then other you know, areas where you might need a, you will need a permission or license will be if you're using replica uniforms of in the police or customs or other um, government forces. Um, if you're using firearms, um, including modified firearms, uh, ammunition, special effects and power techniques, anything that's blowing up and, and things like that, you would need um, a permission. If you're using legal weapons, because um, basically possessing possession of legal weapons is against the law in Hong Kong, or if your shooting require special parking requirements or if you require roads to be closed for your shootings, and obviously you would need to um, liaise with the government to arrange for lane closures. Um, otherwise, um, most people actually, especially local film production crew, they just shoot anywhere in Hong Kong and they don't usually have to uh, ask for specific permissions. Um, in fact, one of the interesting things, um, I've done a lot of clearance for studios shooting in Hong Kong. Um, I realize that there are actually a lot of differences in the law as well. So, for example, in Hong Kong, um, there, is a, there is an exemption under copyright law where if you're filming uh, public buildings and sculptures, um, there is an exemption from copyright infringement. So you can freely um, film you know, buildings or anything situated in the public um, without having to get permission from the owners of buildings. Next slide, please. 
So other general laws to observe um, are basically actually common sense. Um, so filming in public places should not obstruct, inconvenience, or endanger members of the public. Um, and then, of course, you have to observe road traffic regulations. You can't just, like, block off the roads or stop in the middle of the road. Um, and then there are noise control uh, laws as well. So you can't uh, make noise that cause annoyance between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. Um, or during a public holiday. But otherwise, um, generally, it's fine. Um, I think, you know, it, it will be hard to compete with all the construction noise in Hong Kong anyway. So uh, this is something that, you know, just have to take note of. Um, obviously, there's uh, other things like no littering. Um, I've actually been fined because someone threw a cigarette butt out of my window, and the fine is like 200 US dollars. So um, this is something that the government does take seriously. Um, and obviously, no damage to uh, public property. Well, yeah. So generally, Hong Kong is a very, very safe place. Um, I think anyone who's been to Hong Kong or who lives in Hong Kong, really, you know, would attest to that. Um, it's a very safe place to live. It's a very safe place to move around. Um, so what happened with the extortion that Michael Bay faced? Um, basically, in some areas of Hong Kong, there obviously are triads around, and um, they will or they may come and try to um, get you to pay them some money. Um, I mean, obviously, they have no rights. Uh, what they will do is probably make a bit of a nuisance to disturb your shootings by, for example, like, you know, making lots of noise with uh, drums or something like that to disturb your shooting. So they're trying to get you to uh, pay them some money so that they could leave you in peace. Um, that is obviously uh, against the law. So when that happens, um, you can report to the police, which is what Michael Bay did. And then, um, you know, problems like that should fall, fall away. <laughs> Um, well, anyway, the government is actually very encouraging um, in in uh, trying to get foreign um, people to come into Hong Kong to shoot. So they have a film services office, um, which has been set up to help people um, conduct a clearance and to answer any questions and to help them and facilitate them in um, shooting in Hong Kong. So if you have any questions or if you want to um, clear with the government or any other um, entities in terms of shooting in different locations, you can contact uh, the film services office. Next slide, please. In terms of immigrations and visas, um, generally uh, most countries can, uh, most people from different countries can come to visit Hong Kong uh, visa-free, whether for business, social, or pleasure, um, up to 180 days. So generally, you do not need a visa to come to Hong Kong to conduct business-related activities, such as you know, having a meeting or scouting for locations. So all the pre-production work um, you do in Hong Kong, you do not need a visa. Obviously, when you actually start shooting in Hong Kong and your director is in Hong Kong or you have um, cast and crew in Hong Kong, um, then you would need to apply for a work visa. So even even though they are employed by, for example, an American company, but because they are working in Hong Kong, then they wouldn't require a work visa. But this is actually quite a straightforward um, uh, procedure, and um, you, if you can justify why this person needs to be in Hong Kong to, uh, you know, to, to conduct the work, then the visa will be granted. Um, uh, uh, warning is that it's, it's supposed to be done before arrival. Um, we've actually helped people um, with all these big awards, uh, ceremonies, etc., and then very often they're very last minute, and we've had situations where the artist is you know, standing in immigration without the visa. Um, but generally, I think immigration departments do try to be very helpful, and they will speed up um, to try to meet your, meet your needs um, in those situations. Um, so even though you might need a work visa in Hong Kong, it does not necessarily mean that you have to pay a local um, uh, income tax. So if you don't work in Hong Kong for more than 60 days, generally, you will be exempt. Next slide, please. Um, and other labor laws, um, again, we don't have any unions in the entertainment industry, so the general laws uh, of employment would apply. So there are certain child labor laws, so if you hire child actors, there will be more stringent um, uh, requirements in relation to the employment. Um, obviously, just like any other countries, that you will, require, you will be required to um, take out um, uh, employee injury compensation insurance and comply with other occupational safety and health laws. Next slide. In terms of in terms of legal um, other legal issues, um, one of the things that's very different between Hong Kong and, for example, in the United States is that, particularly in the entertainment industry, people are not used to signing uh, very formal contracts. And even if they do, um, they certainly don't. They're not used to signing, you know, 50-page contracts. So this is one of the areas where uh, we have seen a lot of resistance and difficulties. Um, most people, I mean, for the local productions, um, often they might go without 
having people sign uh, a contract. And even if they do, they're often very, very simple one-page contract. And um, in fact, if you look at it carefully, you realize that the, the, you know, a lot of the times the contract terms doesn't make any sense because people just cut and paste it from whatever they found. Um, so it's more just sort of like, you know, a formality that they go, okay, just sign something uh, without actually looking at it. So for a U.S. studio where you in, where you intend to distribute around the world and having a clear chain of title is very important, um, this is something that you do need to pay attention to and make sure that you uh, look at the agreements that have to be signed and make sure that you do get them signed. Otherwise, you will find that, you know, you might get, not get a clear, clear chain of title. However, in doing that, um, uh, do beware of local customs. Um, very often, if you present someone, for example, if you want to shoot at a location and you give the owner a 50-page contract, um, likelihood is that they will refuse to sign. Um, currently, we're helping a studio shoot in Macau, and that's exactly what happened. Um, even though they've got government uh, um, authorization to shoot around the area and it's a government building, um, whoever is in charge of the building absolutely refused to sign any contracts because they, you know, they, they're just very um, resistant to having to sign something that looks very serious. So this is something that. Um, need to be kept in mind. Um, very often we will help clients localize the agreement so that we make it shorter, much e much more easy to understand. Um, sometimes we'll translate them into Chinese as well so that it will be bilingual. Um, people will be able to um, understand um, uh, what the agreement means and then they might feel more comfortable signing these agreements. Um, another area that I often see is that um, when using U.S. contracts, um, there are lots of terminologies which are being used. For example, uh, uh, work made for hire. Um, this is a terminology that does not appear in Hong Kong copyright law. So under Hong Kong law, there's no such thing as work made for hire. So depending on what the users of the contracts are for in future, um, you might consider also localizing your agreement so that it uh, complies with long co Hong Kong law um, and uses Hong Kong legal terminology. Um, finally, another area I always see is that um, obviously wherever you are from, you always feel more comfortable using your own courts and using your law uh, in the agreements. Um, how, and, and very often I would see, you know, exclusive um, California jurisdiction and, uh, you know, California law, um, things like that. But um, in terms of enforcement, this might cause you difficulties because U.S. judgments are not automatically enforceable in Hong Kong. So I've seen situations where um, clients have used exclusive U.S. jurisdiction and find that in the end, even though they might have gotten a judgment against someone in Hong Kong, they are unable to enforce that judgment in Hong Kong. So when doing your uh, contracts with local um, uh, cast and crew, be careful and beware of things like that. Next slide, please. Um, fi finally, just some overall general tips. Um, the West is not like the East, um, and so it's important to respect local culture. Um, local languages, customs, and um, also the legal differences. Um, I think it is important to get local help, so whether hiring a local line producer, um, a production services company to assist you and to um, help you liaise with the local um, uh, people and to help you clear, clear, uh, do clearances in Hong Kong, I think that's very, very important. Um, finally, uh, Chinese people, you know, for, for them, faith is very important. Um, so make sure that, you know, it, you know, when you speak to people and deal with people, you have to um, be gentle with them. Um, they're not used to, you know, direct confrontation. And so giving them respect and not embarrassing them directly and making them look good um, takes you a long way. So on a closing note, I think um, despite Michael Bay's bad experience, um, he did put on record to say that he will definitely come back to shoot in Hong Kong. So I think um, if you are just aware of all the local uh, regulatory requirements and customs, then it should be um, interesting. It should be a good experience. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Roger. I can start. Hello, this will be an introduction to uh, copyright protection. Next, please. Uh, generally speaking, uh, if there's a copyright infringement, we got a um, uh, civil uh, liability channel and criminal liability channel. So talking about um, how to proceed with the copyright infringement protection, uh, we got uh, two, two, two options. So you will know that we have an intellectual property court, which is uh, exclusively uh, handle the uh, copyright infringement cases 
And if you are looking for a crypto uh, a, a, a protection, and there's a, there's a specialized police force, we call an IP police. They are really good in um, uh, collecting evidence and and and, and transfer your case uh, to the uh, prosecutor's office. So, so in Taiwan, the copyright holders they use the IP police a lot. Basically, you just orally file a complaint, and they will take over the case and and and, and move them forward. And after that, the case will go to the prosecutor's office, and then the regular court. And the final uh, uh, tribunal will be the uh, criminal tribunal of the uh, intellectual property court. Next, please. So, uh, talking about what kind of work and enjoy uh, protection in Taiwan, we will talk about the uh, so-called originality. <laughs> the legal standard for satisfying the originality is not very high. So, I can give you a, a an, I mean, example. Um, the Japanese born DVD in Taiwan has been um, held by the courts for like over decades that they are not copyrightable because there's no um, originality. But uh, two years ago, uh, our IP court held that in a number of cases held that well, even the, the porn DVD they can they, they, they can have the uh, uh, originality. So you can have a hinge that the level of the uh, uh, or the threshold of of, of the uh, originality is reasonably low. Next, please. Uh, in Taiwan, it's a very special uh, legal right for the copyright holder, which which uh, which is uh, very different from the uh, U.S. and U.K. practice. That is a so-called moral right. Uh, we the copyright owner will have um, well the legal right. And moral right. So called the moral right means uh, right to uh, publicly uh, release, and right to indicate your name, and right to maintain the same formality of your work. So, for example, if you, if you, even you are licensed to use a um, movie or a work, if you made it from black to color, if you color it, you may infringe the moral right. So uh, it will be very important for you to notice that. And other legal rights will be very similar to uh, international standard in, in Taiwan. Next, please. Um, fair use will be a big issue because uh, most of the infringers would say that, well, it's a fair use. So we would uh, think about uh, purpose, nature, amount, amount or portion they used, and effect, which is um, highly similar to the international standard. Um, next, please. Well, criminal liability. Um, generally, uh, we have two uh, two two kinds of uh, um, effect. It is up to three years, or it's up to five years, depending on whether it is a a, a, a business purpose or, or profit seeking purpose, and it's not very difficult for you to apply for a search warrant and get allowed by a judge. So in a case that you know there's a, there's a stock of the infringing items, you can have the search warrant and you can seize, you, you can detain the infringing items. It would not that difficult for you to, to complete all the procedures in Taiwan. In talking about civil liability, um, you can, if you know that there's there gonna be infringement and has not yet happened, you can you can have, you know, you know file motion for preventing it. Then, if it happens, you can ask for remo uh, uh, removal of the infringement. Uh, talking about damages calculation, uh, you you will have two options: one is the lost profit and damages, and the and the other is uh, you can take over 100% of the infringer's profit. So, so in Taiwan, copyright infringement case could be big uh, if the infringer's infringing model is big. And certainly, after you seize and detain all the infringing items, you can you can ask for um, destruction. Uh, that is a very quick brief view uh, of the uh, uh, copyright protection in Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you, Roger.
Hello. Um, while we're still up in Taiwan, um, can we now hear from Monica Wang? Mm -hmm. Taiwan Law? Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Monica. Okay. Did I sound now? Yes, please begin. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Monica Wang from the National Attorney for I've been practicing industrial policy for around 10 years in Taiwan. And today I'm going to talk about Taiwan intellectual property police majors who are dealing with online copyright infringement. Please, next page. To start off, I'd like to give you some background information. Internet piracy of copyrighted materials remains widespread in Taiwan and particularly popular on the use of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and the use of peer-to-peer -peer streaming provided by forums and blogs for downloading, viewing, and listening to movie and musical content via computer set-up boxes or mobile devices. While the takedown rates for forums and blogs posted in Taiwan remain high, the website and traders have continuously and intentionally posted in posting their forums and blogs in over this country. This tactic makes it relatively difficult for our law enforcement agencies to nail down the administrators and shut down such illegal sites. In particular, under the laws of Taiwan, as a general rule, copyright infringers may be prosecuted only if the right holder files a criminal complaint with the law enforcement agency to initiate criminal investigation proceedings. Access to this are restrictively limited to offenders who reproduce copyrighted materials by manufacturing pirated optical discs for sale, or who possess or publicly display pirated optical discs for distribution. And hence, with the dual difficulty of locating the administrator responsible for running the foreign-based website and of locating the right holder of the infringed copyrighted material uh, account, the intellectual property rights police or so-called IPR police have previously been reluctant to tackle online infringement issues when our authorized content state is obtained to website located overseas. However, in recent years, with the help of the right holders as well as their agents in Taiwan, the IPR police have started to attack the problem at the bottom by suppressing the illegal use of this core and a similar peer-to-peer -peer software <coughs> in the app search for the submission as spread of unauthorized copyrighted materials by end users. This and the next slide briefly introduces the procedures used by the IPR police to combat the current users engaged in copyright infringement. Let's go back to the previous page. Back to the previous page. Hello? Hello? Yes, hello. hello. Yeah, let's go back to the previous page. Good slide. Okay, thank you. First, the right holders or their agents will access internet programs or meta search websites to search for .torrent meta files or magnetic links that might contain copyright infringing material. Next, then the right holders or their agents use the fine software, for example, new torrent, to download such material and to ascertain whether they infringe any copyright. Data that appears is meanwhile collected, usually by a network contractor, for proper logging from the client software. The IP addresses, client software, traffic flow, and of can be Yes, will be collected, as you can see from this screenshot. Let's go to the next page. Third, the right holders or their agents then contest and submit the data they collected to the IP police. The IP police will then provide the IP address to the relevant ISP providers and request the ISP providers to report back personal information including the name, number files, phone numbers of persons who correspond to the IP addresses, and also to report back the geolocations of the IP addresses. As you can see from the screenshot, the ISP provider has identified the name, address, and relevant information of the user based on the IP address provided by the IP police. Or, depending on the severity of the infringement <coughs> of as well as any request made by the right holder, IPR police will determine if a raid is necessary 
for examining the infringer for police interrogation will verify. If a raid is necessary, the IPR police with the required information, including the name of the big common user and the geolocation of the IP addresses, will seek to obtain a criminal search warrant from the court to an institution filed by the IPR police with a search warrant <coughs> I could address to retrieve the copyright infringing material on the hard disk of the computer. Lastly, the material collected by the ITL police will be used as evidence of illegal reproduction and public submission of copyrighted materials by the physical users. A violation subject to a maximum of three year infringement and a maximum fine of approximately twenty four thousand US dollars. Now let's talk about the actions against physical users. Now let's move on to the website for seeing this file. As for a website that directly facilitates the change in search of the meta files and mental links, the IPR police have recently attempted to work together with other jurisdictions to nail down the administrators of some of the most notorious Taiwanese routes on a big website. For example, one particular popular website targeted at Chinese language users, me.com. The 14th most access site in Taiwan and the 43rd most access site in Hong Kong and has a worldwide Alexa ranking, ranking of 486. This site is notorious for infringing copyrighted motion pictures, musical works, and video games. The domain name registry concept of this website is the U.S., or the administrator is believed to be a Taiwan citizen. The IPL police have been working with U.S. enforcement agencies to identify the administrator of the website so as to bring the responsible person to justice. Let's turn to the next page. Another popular method of infringement used is peer-to-peer -peer video streaming, which has recently increased in popularity in Taiwan due to its easy access and convenience. Sites which host peer-to-peer -peer streaming media popular to Chinese-speaking users are usually located in China such as well-known function peer-to-peer -peer streaming media, and provide users TV programs and movies on demand. Let's turn to the next page. Technically, those access in the streams can be traced. However, peer-to-peer -peer streaming usually only leads consciously a small portion or even an unplayable segment of the video, video on the user's computer. And as such, the IPR police have great difficulties in Ensuring any evidence to go after this type of copyright infringement. In any event, most peer-to-peer -peer streaming software is customized as an application and preloaded into setup boxes, or also known as SGB, for sale to end users, and hence holding the manufacturer or seller of this type of SGB viable is now a priority task of the IPR police. Let's turn to the next page. The use of SPV facilitating such infringement is prevalent in Taiwan. In fact, it is now the best tested grown type of internet based pirate in Taiwan. So SPV can directly connect users to popular pirate sites and allow users to download copyrighted content. Other SPV work as video training clients, maintaining a list of pirate streamers to assist users in doing copyright infringing videos online. In short, STB can be considered navigators of pirate resources. The pirate resource maps in the STB are regularly updated by the manufacturers and sellers. However, the actual online pirate resources that these devices direct to generally have no direct position to the STB manufacturers and sellers. The motion picture industry has detected more than 30 different brands of such devices now available in the marketplace in Taiwan. Let's turn to the next page. What can the IPR police do to help right holders if they have this kind of intention? <coughs> the IPR police will check the availability of such boxes on the market and will release information to right holders as soon as they suspect infringement of the right holder's copyrighted work. Alternatively, the right holder may share its information with the IPR police to initiate an investigation proceeding. First of all, I briefly introduce this to the procedure. First, the IPR police will inform the right holder of copyright infringement facilitated by STV, or conversely, the right holder will inform the IPR police of the same. Second, the right holder purchases the STV device in question, but reports the entire process of how to use the device, 
connect to the foreign pirate site and download the copyrighted material into the device. Or if the STD works to video streaming device, the right folder will record a segment of the video that is doable by using the device. Third, the right folder files the criminal complaint against the manufacturer or seller of the device and the function of the device serves as evidence of infringement. Fourth, the type of infringement involving the manufacturer or sale of devices facilitating copyright infringement for commercial gain rate is almost always considered necessary so as to seize the infringing devices as well as the account books of the infringer. And hence, the IPR police will seek to obtain a criminal search warrant from the court with an application filed by the participant. Lastly, the IPR police with the search warrant will raise the manufacturer or seller of the STV device to seize the infringing STV devices. These devices constitute solid evidence of illegal supply of computer programs or other technology to be used to publicly transmit or reproduce copyrighted work without the consent of the right holder, which violation is subject to a maximum of two years imprisonment and the maximum fine of approximately $15,800. US dollars. To wrap things up, as you can understand from my comments, it is important for right holders to take an active role in assisting assisting the police to initiate investigation procedures. Thus, it is highly recommended that a foreign right holder appoint an agent in Taiwan to contact, share information with, and file complaints to the police. For example, here in US big studios, such as thermal studios, are represented by the Taiwan International Center. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Um, we're going to switch now and uh, talk about the People's Republic of China. And on the phone, we have Julia Charlton, uh, uh, the partner of Charlton's Law in Hong Kong, who's going to talk about the PRC. Julia? Julia? Thank you very much, Janice. Um, uh, good morning, everybody, and good evening if you're in the States. Um, I'm a corporate finance lawyer working in Hong Kong and China with a lot of film companies, both uh, U.S. companies and domestic Chinese companies. Well, I think you maybe all know that, um, uh, if we could have the introductory slide, please, that China is the world's fastest-growing film market. In 2010, China ranked eighth in the league table of global film markets, and in 2012, China overtook Japan and became the world's second largest film market after the U.S. In 2014, there were 618 Chinese films produced, down from 638 produced the previous year. However, less than half of these made it to the cinema. Despite producing 20 films less than in 2013, China's box office receipts hit um, 4.82 billion U.S. dollars, reflecting growth of about 36 ranking it second again after the U.S., whose box office receipts were around 10 billion U.S. in 2014. According to the president of Warner Brothers International, it's expected that the film market in China will be the world's largest within five to ten years. Slide, next slide, please. Local films accounted for 55 percent, that's 2.6 billion U.S. dollars of China's film market in 2014. Combined overseas growth of Chinese films reached 305 million U.S., up 32% compared to the previous year. There were over 1,000 cinema complexes opened in China in 2014, adding over 5,000 new screens, an average of 15 new screens per day, and bringing the total number of screens to over 23,000. Urban cinema admissions also reached 830 million, showing an increase of 34% compared with 617 million the year before. As more cinemas open in second and lower tier regions, the national <laughs> ticket price is expected to be pulled down lower, and this may boost cinema admissions further. So this is really a sweet spot in the film and cinema world. Uh, next slide, please. Movies shown in China are either imported from overseas markets or produced by local companies, sometimes jointly with a foreign production house. Um, looking first at imported foreign films, China maintains tight control of the screening of foreign films in China, possibly due to fear that the local film industry might be compromised by a completely open market, as happened in Taiwan. 
There are currently two business models for releasing foreign films in China, revenue sharing and flat flat rate, i.e. a buyout. So firstly, looking at revenue sharing. Since 1995, China has imported a set number of foreign movies on a revenue sharing basis, the so-called quota system, a model commonly adopted in other jurisdictions. The initial quota was 10, which was raised to 20 as a condition of joining WTO in 2000. In 2012, China settled a 2007 complaint filed with the WTO by the U.S. in relation to the distribution of foreign films. And in the 2012 settlement agreement, China agreed to increase market access for U.S. films and allowed for screening of 14 premium format films on top of the original import quota of 20. Foreign films are currently imported through only two authorized distributors, China Film Group Corporation and Huaxia Film Distribution. Under the quota system, foreign producers take as capped to 25% of the box office. That was 18% pre-2012. On top of that, foreign producers are responsible for all marketing costs, which averaged 11% of box office takings in 2014. Flat rate. Um, China also imports foreign films on a flat rate basis each year, under which film owners will sell the China distribution right to authorized distributors at a, at a flat rate. Foreign films under both the quota system and the flat rate system have to pass a censorship review. And despite import restrictions, China is fast becoming a major overseas market for Hollywood filmmakers. In 2014, the 34 foreign films allowed under the quota grossed 1.8 billion U.S., an increase of 60% on the 2013 figure, and accounted for about one-third of the total box office in China. 2014's most successful foreign film by far was Transformers 4. Um, Possible relaxations. China is reportedly planning to relax its current quota of 34 foreign films per year in February 2017 on the expiry of its current quota system, which is valid for five years from 2012. There have also been reports that China may increase the current 34 film quota to 44 in the meantime. Um, Next slide. Um, Many foreign production houses have now turned to the China Film Co-Production Corporation instead um, and opt for a joint production model. The economic split between distributor and producer for Sino-Foreign Co-Productions is on a negotiated basis, and generally this split gives foreign producers a larger share than movies imported under the quota system. Films qualifying as co-production projects under the relevant regulations are not subject to the import quota, and these joint production projects thus offer production houses better ex- access to the Chinese market. Co-production also allows production houses easier access to low-cost cost resources for filming in China. A Sino um, foreign co-production is a contractual arrangement between a foreign party and a Chinese fo- party to film in China. There may be multiple parties on each side, provided that the lead Chinese party or parties must be a production entity that has obtained the applicable film production license from the film regulator, the State Administration of Radio, Film and TV, SAFT. For the purpose of Sino-Foreign Co-Production, investors or producers from Hong Kong and Macau and the Territory of Taiwan are considered to be foreign parties. The most common types of the three permitted um, types of co-production are joint production and assisted production. The third type is commissioned production. So joint production um, involves Chinese and foreign parties jointly investing in and producing the film, sharing the copyright in the film, and the project's risks and profits, and this is by far the most popular mode. The Sino-French co-produced film The Nightingale was China's entry to the 2015 Oscars for Best Foreign Film. There's assisted production, where the foreign party provides all the capital and the Chinese party is hired for production of film. The product of an assisted production is owned by the foreign party and the film can't be released in China unless it's imported by an authorized agent such as the China Film Group Film Import and Export Corporation. However, assisted productions are still subject to the import quota on foreign films. In 2014, the hit Transformer was the third Sino-Foreign co-produced film that adopts this production mode. Next slide, please. Um, Joint Production House. 
There are um, regulations which allow foreign investors to incorporate a film production company in the form of an equity joint venture or cooperative joint venture with Chinese film production companies. However, the investors are required to have controlling interests in the equity joint venture or cooperative joint venture. Warner China Film HD Corporation, incorporated in 2004, was the first China foreign equity joint venture um, on these lines. However, the attempt to allow foreign investment in film production was suspended very shortly after when the PRC Ministry of Culture and other government agencies issued a circular which prohibited foreign investors from establishing or investing film production companies in July 2005. Foreign investment in film production again became available in 2012 after China and the U.S. signed the WTO agreement, and the first Sino-Foreign Animation Production House, Oriental Dreamworks, was established in February 2012. Um, the first round of investment involved 330 million U.S. dollars of capital, with DreamWorks holding 45%, and they produced Kung Fu Panda 3, which is expected to be released in 2017. Disney has also announced plans on cooperating with ACG China and Tencent. Next slide, please. A common feature of Sino-foreign co-produced films is that the version shown in China is often a few minutes longer as it includes scenes made especially for the Chinese audience. Um, there was the American-Chinese co-production Looper um, between USN Game Entertainment and Chinese Dynamic Marketing Group, Iron Man 3, 2014's Transformers, Age of Extinction, and Miss Granny was, um, a, is a 2015 film co-produced by China's Beijing Wenchan Shiji Media and Korea's CJ E&M. Um, the film grossed 350 million RMB at the box office, breaking the record for Sino-Korean um, uh, co-produced films. Um, there is a... Um, there are some film co-production agreements. Um, there's one between China and South Korea, China and India, and there is one between the U.S. and China, where Disney partnered with Shanghai Media Group in March last year to develop and produce action, fantasy, and adventure films. Next slide, please. Um, foreign investment in China's film production and distribution industries have been restricted and prohibited under Chinese foreign investment catalogs. In the most recently released version of the catalogue, released in December uh, last year, film production remains restricted to cooperation with a Chinese film producer, while foreign investment in film distribution and production houses is prohibited. However, the Chinese government carved out an exception for Hong Kong and Macau. Investors from these two jurisdictions are permitted to establish wholly owned subsidiaries in China for the distribution of China-made films. Um, here is... Um, a, um, an illustration of China's film value chain illustrating the barriers to foreign investors in China. Um, next slide, please. Um, Pre-production pre approvals under the film regulations. There are two types of soft licenses allowing production distribution within China and exportation of films. That's film production license single film and a film production license for which companies that have produced two or more films under a single film may apply. Um, there's also um, a co-production permits are required, and if post-production is to be conducted outside of China, parties must apply for approval in advance. Next slide, please. Censorship is a major form of pre-screening approval. There's no formal rating system, um, uh, but there's a list of prohibited contents. Um, leading figures in China's film industry are currently calling on the government to codify how it regulates and restricts filmmaking. Um, next slide, please. Um, just finally, Hong Kong is a gateway to China. We've heard about the IP and the production um, capabilities within Hong Kong. There is something called the CEPA, the China e Closer Economic Partnership Agreement between Hong Kong and China, which serves as a way to circumvent the quota system. So Chinese language films produced by Hong Kong companies are not subject to the import quota set for foreign films. So that may be an interesting way to access the China market. Um, thank you very much. And um, our last presenter um, is an an Andrea um, from Shenzhen Orlov in, in, in Beijing. Yes, hello, um, this is Andrea Carayes, so from, uh, I'm head of the Spanish office at uh, Schmidt & Olas. Um, I'm based in China, though. 
I've been practicing IP here for uh, over three years. And so, Shmith and Olaf, to like very um, um, briefly introduce us, we are a full-service IP firm based in China, but we also operate in Russia and Southeast Asia. So, um, I'm going to introduce, um, a, in a general way, copyright enforcement in China. Uh, could we go to slide two, please? Um, so, here I, I more or less summarize all the uh, main um, characteristics of Chinese copyright, but I'd like to uh, <coughs> voluntary prior registration. We saw that registration is not uh, needed in China for uh, uh, U.S. copyright owners because they are in the Berne Convention. However, um, we strongly recommend um, voluntary registration. It was actually set by the National uh, Copyright Administration in, back in the 90s so um, in order to prove ownership in China, it will be highly recommended to uh, register your copyright, actually also because it's really fast and inexpensive. It's about, it takes about for a fast track recordation between two and five days, and for the normal procedure, it's about uh, one month. And uh, the average cost of official fees, just to give you an idea, are about 220 US dollars for a one copyright in a normal procedure and about 260 for uh, the fast track, so the under a week procedure. Um, can we go to slide three, please? Um, um, so, to talk a little bit about uh, to talk about enforcement. I like to to focus a little bit about registration because the registration strategy would then give you the enforcement options. Um, so. Um, I'd like to point out that nearly every business uh, across all sectors has copyrights, whether they use them, enforce them, register them or not. A common misconception is to link copyright to content production companies, so it is important to set up a strategy taking a holistic approach of your IP and thinking of a multi-layered strategy, not just copyright maybe combining uh, with other IP. Uh, maybe if you have a prior copyright registration, it can be considered if you're thinking to launch your products in the China in the next, for example, six months and uh, while you're registering your brand because trademark registration takes about uh, eight to 12 months while copyright can be done under a week. Uh, maybe if a third party has registered your logo before you, then you could proceed with fast track copyright recorder and set the date of the first publication of your logo. So copyright can intervene once infringement is uh, already present. Uh, so we can see that different options can be considered in terms of timing, um, also in terms of the form of the registration, like different works can be registered in one single form as a series of works to be uh, so uh, faster and uh, cheaper. Uh, so really think and discuss with your console your options, objectives, business model in order to determine the best strategy for you. In any case, as the registration has no substantive examination, it is just formal examination, always think of gathering all the necessary evidences to prove the date of creation or the first publication of the work. The copyright registration constitutes a proof of ownership that might help saving time and money later on if there's a copyright dispute. So uh, as I said before, it is highly recommended to consider registration in order to enforce your copyrights in China. Uh, can we go to slide four? Uh, so we will now enter in the heart of the subject. There are four main channels to enforce your copyrights in uh, China. There's the administrative enforcement, uh, there's also the civil litigation and criminal enforcement in the judicial system, and also customs enforcement. Um, of these channels, civil litigation is the most commonly used. Um, among the differences, as you can see in this comparative chart, we can easily uh, perceive that the access to the four different methods it depends on the size and the gravity of the infringement. And that way, way, while all types of copyrights are protected, not all types of infringements can be administratively, administratively or criminally enforced. Only those found by authorities to be causing damage to public interest uh, could be administratively enforced, and only more serious cases can, can go uh, towards the criminal uh, channel. So also the difference on the length uh, of the process 
It's shorter with administrative enforcement, which normally takes about three months from filing the complaint, uh, like a complete complaint with all the the, the necessary uh, evidences, to the punishment decision. Uh, while civil litigation involving a foreign party normally takes, according to our own um, practice, about 12 to 18 months. Um, so that could be uh, considered too. And as for the evidence needed to support the claim, well, we find some clear uh, differences as well. And the institute of enforcement requires evidence of ownership, of the infringement, and the um, right owner's identity. So uh, that's why um, it's highly recommended to register. Um, and for uh, civil uh, litigation, it would be uh, longer um, and more costly evidence gathering. Uh, it has to be gathered before uh, the oral hearings, and once the once uh, a party files the complaint, it has one month to uh, gather evidence. Uh, for criminal procedure, it would be PSB, uh, who would uh, has sole discretion on whether to accept a criminal case and collect and assess evidences. Um, and last, uh, customs enforcement. Uh, the evidence required depends on whether recorder, recorder with customs has been previously made. made. Um, so there's another, finally, another comparative factor of great interest, whether these procedures award damages. Um, as you can see, administrative enforcement issues punishment decision or a rectification fine. Therefore, in order to obtain damages, it would be necessary to enforce copyright through civil litigation. Uh, criminal um, enforcement offers a different solution, which is confiscation of materials, compensation, uh, criminal detention, um, and even jail time for the infringement. Infringer. Uh, finally, the option offered by customs enforcement consists on mainly seizure of intercepted goods and a fine to the infringer. Um, can we go to uh, slide five? So uh, to concentrate a bit more on administrative enforcement, administrative enforcement of copyright is quite a unique procedure uh, that is normally carried out by the local branches of the National Copyright Administration. As I said before, the National Copyright Administration introduced the voluntary uh, registration of copyrights. So if you want to use the administrative uh, channel, um, it would be very, very much uh, advised to uh, register your copyright before in order to prove the ownership. So in order to activate this channel, the copyright owner should demonstrate that the infringement is considered to cause damage to public interest. Even if we don't find a clear-cut definition of this criteria, usually Chinese practice consider four factors, which are um, whether the infringement is a repeated offense, uh, the intentional character of the infringement, the legal content of the infringement, as well as the commercial um, purpose. So uh, on, this, on that, uh, on that um, uh, subject, we have a very uh, recent case which has been very uh, famous in China, the court case that I presented uh, before, which was uh, which um, the, the infringer was, uh, had a fine for uh, about 260 million RMB, is the biggest fine in the history of administrative copyright enforcement and it corresponded to three times the turnover of the business. Um, obviously, the, the offense was repeated. They were offering online um, movies <coughs> copyrighted material. So um, this, this offender had about 80 uh, complaints already from, uh, from uh, copyright owners. Um, the, the infringement obviously was, was uh, uh, intentional, and also there was uh, the character, uh, the, the legal content was also um, uh, very much linked to the uh, pornographic character of the of the movies uh, who were uh, offered. Um, so, well, that that was a very uh, particular case. Um, so, to um, to go to, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, about judicial enforcement. So uh, civil um, litigation is, um, is uh, much more used in China in order to enforce copyrights because it's the only way uh, the copyright owner can, have, uh, can get damages. So uh, in, in the practical way, we often uh, do uh, administrative enforcement as a first stage in order to, because it's three months, you can get a punishment decision. 
which will give you a very strong proof of the infringement. Um, and then we use this punishment decision in the framework of a civil litigation in order to get uh, damages. So that's, that would be a common, um, uh, common practice in China in terms of order of uh, channels of activating uh, in order to enforce your copyrights. And then, um, well, criminal prosecution is uh, very much um, linked to uh, um, most uh, grave cases. So normally it's about 500 copies or uh, 35,000 RMB of uh, gains from, for, from uh, the infringer. And, uh, well, it's the only uh, channel that offers imprisonment or um, uh, suspension. Um, I, I will also like to, uh, to strengthen uh, custom enforcement uh, because uh, it, it really depends on your business and if it's interesting for you to enforce copyrights uh, within uh, the borders of China. But uh, uh, just to strengthen that um, Chinese customs are very proactive administration that works really, really well. Uh, that's why we, we often, um, if, if it's interesting for you to enforce your copyright in customs, we uh, recommend very strongly to um, uh, register the copyrights. It's about, it costs about 120 uh, US dollars and it takes uh, 30 working days. Um, and then um, Chinese customs officials are actually very proactive because they monitor both entrance and exit of goods in China. So, uh, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an administration to keep in mind and, uh, and if it, if it uh, goes with your uh, business model. So um, finally, to go to the last slide. Uh, so again, cost approach. Um, so um, many points are to be considered in order to enforce your copyright in China. Uh, there's still a copyright enforcement of uh, foreign copyrights. It's a very uh, a small percentage of, uh, of, uh, criminal, of um, copyright enforcement uh, above, uh, inside mainland China. So, um, but it's increasing and, uh, and more uh, Chinese courts are used to, to get uh, foreign parties and all Chinese administration is used to get foreign parties. So the, the enforcement is getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, then we get, we just uh, recently uh, uh, seen the, 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 the start of uh, IP specialized courts. Although they do not take copyright enforcement for the first instance, it's just from appeal. Um, but, um, but it's very interesting because they're really, really sophisticated and they're really, really, um, um, this, this is a strong hopes on these courts to um, get to sophisticated practice in all China. Uh, then um, about damages, uh, to be honest, damages are quite low, um, especially <coughs> active. Uh, but Supreme Court really encourages all um, um, <coughs> civil courts to increase the damage. And, uh, and so we'll see, um, hopefully, in the near future, a slow, uh, gradual increase of uh, damages. And, um, and well, also consider that as a foreign party, all evidence that is gathered outside China needs to be legalized. So, um, well, apart from gathering evidence, you have to think of these extra costs um, 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 if you need to uh, present all evidence. So, um, thank you for your time, and uh, please uh, feel free to ask me for the questions. Well, let's go to slide eight, where it's, um, you can see my email. So, feel free to just uh, send me an email or ask me for the questions about copyright enforcement in China later on. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Andrea. Um, now, uh, for the for the presenters, who, for the listeners who are going to Hong Kong Film Mart, mm -hmm. um, we have someone from our, our consulate in Hong Kong who will be able to talk to us about some of the things going on at the Film Mart. Mm -hmm. Fanny. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, thanks, Janice. This is Fanny Chow, and I'm um, from the U.S. Commercial Service Hong Kong office. Uh, thank you for being here with us this morning or this evening. Um, my, my presentation will be quite brief. I want to share with you two things today. Uh, the first one is about Filmart 2015. And um, the Filmart show will be held in the Hong Kong Convention Center from March 23rd to... <coughs> 
And uh, our department has been certifying the show since 2005. Uh, the show year by year, and it is now the Asia's largest film market. Uh, this year, we have about uh, over 40 U.S. exhibitors at the show. Um, each year, our office supports film market by recruiting regional buyers to the show. And um, this year, our regional buy our colleagues from the region has recruited uh, more than 130 buyer companies to come to come to the show. We then share these buyers list with our U.S. exhibitors. Um, other than that, we also support our U.S. exhibitors by providing them with free country-specific counseling sections. So for, for example, if you're interested in a particular country, uh, you can let us know, and then we'll sign you up. And um, during the show, you can meet with that uh, uh, country specialist, um, which we will be able to provide you with country-specific information. And actually, Janice Wingo, who is our uh, MC today, she will also be at the Film Mart to offer free counseling session relating to IPR issues. And um, each year, we also host a networking reception together with the show organizer, Hong Kong TDC, uh, which provides uh, like a platform uh, for our U.S. exhibitors to mingle with uh, local and international buyers. So if you haven't been to FIMART or you are going to exhibit at FIMART, um, we'll be there to support your presence. Uh, next slide, please. Actually, slide number three. <laughs> The second thing I want to share with you this morning is um, a seminar that we launched in 2014, um, which was the first one that we, we did last year. It's called China's Pearl River Delta Opportunities to Finance U.S. Film Productions Seminar. Uh, the objective of the seminar was to provide a platform for U.S. producers to pitch their film projects to uh, Chinese investors. Um, at last year's seminar, we had our U.S. company um, individually pitch uh, introduce the company and then they pitch their projects to a group of China film investors. Um, their presentation was then followed by a networking reception where the, where the China side and our U.S. Um, companies can mingle and then build a connection. Um, next slide, please. Last year we, was the first time that we launched the seminar. It was really well re re uh, received by our U.S. companies and China investors. We have indeed uh, reported the signing of two co-production projects uh, as a result of the seminar. Uh, the next few slides are snapshots from our last year's seminar event. So um, we have received a lot of positive feedback from last year. And so this year, we will have the same seminar again. Uh, but slightly different is this year, we, we added a panel discussion uh, to cover the topic of um, the opportunities and challenges of U.S. and China co-production. Um, the, the last slide, please. Well, although our pitching slot at this moment, they're all filled up, uh, but U.S. companies are still welcome to register with me um, as an audience and join our reception. I have list um, our contact information on the last slide. If you're interested, please contact me or Ms. Jerry Colleaf, um, who is based out of Guangzhou, China. So um, that's all I have this morning. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Fanny. And um, operator, I know we've gone over time, but do we have any questions for the presenters very quickly? And has it even dialed in for a question? I'm showing no questions in our queue. If you'd like to ask a question, you can press star 1 and record your name. Again, that's star 1 and record your name. <coughs> okay, and it looks, looks like we have nobody in queue at this time. Okay. Well, I wanted to thank all the presenters for staying on the line so um, so early in the morning or late at night. Um, and again, thank you again for your presentations. You can contact Janice Wingo at trade.gov um, if you need to get an audio recording of this presentation. Um, thank you again. I'll see you at Hong Kong so on the 23rd. That does conclude today's conference. Thank you all for participating. You may disconnect at this time.